All right, hi everyone, I'm Sean. Um, as Lindy mentioned, I'm the co-founder and uh, chief hardware architect at Cerebris Systems. When we uh, started Cerebris in 2016, we had a, a vision and a mission to really drastically change the landscape of compute uh, for AI. Uh, we wanted radical improvements and that required radically new technology. To solve the problem of deep learning compute at Cerebra Systems, we have built the largest chip in the world. And this is what that looks like. This is our chip. It's the largest processor ever built. It's a single chip, it's a single piece of silicon. It's over 46,000 square millimeters in size. In that enormous size, we can pack 1.2 trillion transistors. It's powering 400,000 AI optimized cores. And the cores are fed by 18 gigabytes of super fast on-chip memory with an unprecedented nine petabytes per second of memory bandwidth. And all the cores are connected by a 100 petabit per second fabric. Now that's a lot of really big numbers, but how big is this chip really compared to other chips today? Well, it's really big. It's in fact the largest square you can carve out of a round 300 millimeter wafer. It's 215 millimeters by 215 millimeters square. That's 8.5 inches per side. The Cerebrus wafer scale engine is 56 times larger than the largest GPU today. And it is the heart of the Cerebrus CS1 system. The CS1 system is a, fully, a full solution in a single system. It's programmed with TensorFlow and other frameworks and installs in a standard data center rack. This makes the Cerebrus CS1 system the world's most powerful AI computer. Now we think that's pretty cool, but the question is why does this make sense and why now? Well, the answer is that deep learning training is hard. Both the size and the shape of the problem make it extremely challenging. The size of the problem is massive. To train a single state-of-the-art neural network today needs peta to exascale compute. The shape of the problem also makes it extremely difficult to scale. There's a lot of fine grain parallelism, but at the coarse grain, the computation is inherently serial. Now that's because the nature of training neural networks is applying a lot of incremental changes serially, one after the other. So the combination of the size and the shape of the problem make it really challenging for today's architectures. Now that's because today's architectures primarily use brute force parallelism. Today, we use dense processors like GPUs connected by traditional interconnects like Ethernet or MB-Link. And we run multiple instances of the same neural network using a technique called data parallelism. Now this works, but is limited by the inherent serial nature of the problem. So the result is that today, you get scaling, but it's limited and it's costly. So the natural question is, how do we do better than this? The right architecture optimized for deep learning needs these key properties. First, the core should be optimized for neural network primitives. Second, the core should be flexible and programmable because neural networks are still evolving. Third, it should be designed for sparse compute because neural networks contain a lot of fine grained sparsity. And next, it should use local memory because neural network weights and activations are all local and have low data reuse. And lastly, it needs a very fast interconnect because neural network communication between layers requires high bandwidth and low latency. Next, I'm going to describe these in more detail. Okay. 
The central component of any architecture is the core. A deep learning optimized core has two key properties. The first property is flexibility and programmability. That's because the neural network field is still evolving and new architectures are being invented every single day. The second property is the ability to run tensor operations really fast. And that's because tensor operations make up the bulk of neural network compute. So to that end, the Cerebrus core is a fully programmable core. It has a full set of flexible operations for control processing. These are instructions that we're all used to in general purpose processing. On top of that flexible foundation, we add optimized tensor operations for high performance data processing. Tensors are first class operands in the instruction set architecture itself. Here's an example of fuse multiply add instruction that can operate on tensors, I'm mean, sorry, registers and memory, just like we're used to. But additionally, the instruction can operate directly on tensors. A key property to consider when designing a core is that neural networks are naturally sparse. This means there's a lot of zeros in the computation. And the main computation in neural networks is a multiply add. And multiply add by zero doesn't change the result at all. So if we built a core optimized for the dense neural network on the left, but in reality, it looked like the sparse neural network on the right, that would be incredibly wasteful. To design a core for sparsity, we must first understand the nature of that sparsity. Where does sparsity come from in neural networks? Common ML techniques such as ReLU and Dropout introduce sparsity naturally into neural networks. Now, both of these techniques are widely used in deep learning, not to introduce sparsity, but because they improve the ML. On the right, you can see the effect of ReLU and Dropout on the forward pass of training. ReLU zeroes out all negative activations and Dropout randomly zeroes activations. So as you can see, the resulting sparsity is very fine-grained and very dynamic. It changes for every activation and is different for every sample. This type of sparsity cannot be harvested by traditional coarse grain matrix multiply data paths. In addition to the forward pass, neural network training requires a backward pass to calculate deltas for the gradient descent algorithm. And it turns out that these common ML techniques are naturally sparse in the backward pass also. The sparsity is equally fine-grained and dynamic. By harvesting this type of sparsity, we can get benefit across all phases of training. ReLU and Dropout are examples where we have uniform sparsity in both the forward and the backward paths of training. But it turns out that sparsity can arise naturally in the backward pass even when the forward pass is dense. This is really important because two thirds of the compute in training is actually in the backward pass. Hard sigmoid and max pool are two examples of this. This is shown on the right. Both of these functions do not create any sparsity in the forward pass. So you might think the network is dense, but they naturally generate sparsity in the backward pass. In the case of hard sigmoid, both constant regions of the function translate to zeros in the backward pass. In the case of max pool, all the values that are smaller than the max translate to zeros in the backward pass. The main takeaway here is that there are many sources of natural sparsity caused by these common ML techniques, sometimes even in cases where the network otherwise appears dense. But in all of these cases, the sparsity is fine-grained and dynamic. So we ask, how do you harvest this type of sparsity? Our compute core has native sparse processing directly in the hardware. 
This is achieved through data flow scheduling, where computation is triggered by the data. The fabric transports both data and associated control in the hardware. Once the core receives the data, it triggers a lookup of the tensor instruction. That tensor instruction is then loaded into a state machine that schedules the data path. The data path performs the tensor operation using operands from both memory or the fabric. And finally, the result is written back to either memory or the fabric. With this data flow scheduling hardware, we can harvest sparsity by simply filtering out all the zeros at the sender. Since the compute is triggered by the data, if the sender doesn't send any data, the receiver doesn't perform any compute. It's really that simple. And by doing this, not only do we save power because we aren't performing all those wasted operations, but we also get acceleration by skipping the wasted work and using those cycles to perform the next useful work. By using a large number of these small cores with fine-grained data paths, we can maximize the utilization for this very dynamic, non-uniform work. And to the end user, not only does this enable higher performance for this naturally occurring sparsity, it also enables the user to explore sparse ML methods that are not practical in GPUs today. The second key component to any architecture is memory. A deep learning optimized memory is local and has low data reuse. This matches the neural network memory, which is used for weights and activations that are all local to every layer. The traditional memory architecture is not optimized for neural networks. The traditional memory is shared, it's slow, and it's far away. It requires high data reuse to get performance through caching. But the fundamental operation in neural networks is a matrix vector multiply, and that has no data reuse. If you were to run a large matrix vector multiply on a traditional memory architecture, the performance would be really poor. Now the ML community has worked around this by running many parallel vectors, transforming that matrix vector multiply into a matrix matrix multiply, which as we all know, has a lot of data reuse. This technique in ML is called batching. And it works to increase uh, the utilization in these traditional memory architectures, but it actually changes the ML training. And so it's not always desirable. The right memory architecture optimized for neural networks is fully distributed with the, uh, with the compute. It uses on-chip SRAM, where the memory is close to the data paths. And that's because the physics of local memory enables higher performance. Driving bits, a few microns from local SRAM to a data path is much easier than driving bits through a package from an external memory. By doing this, we get orders of magnitude higher bandwidth and lower power compared to off-chip memory. This architecture enables the data path to have full performance from memory even with low data reuse. What it means is you get full performance on the native matrix vector multiply operation at any batch size. The total memory capacity is designed to support the largest models of today. But in addition to being more efficient from a power and performance perspective, it turns out that the distributed memory architecture is also more efficient in capacity for two reasons. The first reason is that in traditional GPU memory, activations are multiplied by the batch size as shown in green. Our distributed memory architecture enables running with batch size as low as one. So this removes the large batch multiplier from activation memory capacity. The second reason is that traditional GPU memory 
weights are replicated by the number of devices in the cluster. And this is shown in blue. In the wafer scale architecture, there's only a single device running a single neural network. So this removes the need for weight replication also. So as you can see, by designing a memory architecture that's optimized for neural networks, we not only get performance and power benefits, but it can be more efficient from capacity also. Now, finally, the, a critical <clears throat> component to any architecture is the interconnect. A deep learning optimized architecture has high bandwidth and low latency interconnect, optimized for lo local communication. And that's because neural network communication is all local from layer to layer. The Cerebrus interconnect is fast and fully configurable. It uses fine grained single word level messaging and it's all in hardware. So there's no software overhead. Our fabric is a 2D mesh topology, which is very efficient for the local communication patterns of neural networks. But to achieve that radical performance gain, training neural networks requires more compute, more compute than we can fit on a single die. We need more cores, we need more on-chip memory, we need more fabric bandwidth, then we can fit on a single die. This is what we need. We need to build big chips. By building a wafer scale chip, we can combine the massive compute, local memory, and, computation, and, and communication bandwidth at a scale never seen before. It allows us to get cluster scale performance on a single chip. That's because we have hundreds of thousands of cores. It allows us to bring gigabytes of memory one clock cycle from every core. This is impossible with off chip memory. It allows us to connect all of these cores with a fully on chip interconnect that's orders of magnitude faster than traditional interconnects. And because the chip is so large, instead of running one layer at a time, we can map the entire neural network to the wafer at once. This allows us to run model parallel, and that gets us full linear performance scaling. And since it's a single instance of the neural network, it means we don't have to increase the batch size to run at cluster scale. It allows the ML to be done the way the ML wants to be done. And because it's a single chip, you get all of this at vastly lower power and less space. So now I've described the wafer scale architecture and how it was designed from ground up to run deep learning at scale. This is what makes the Cerebrus CS1 system with the wafer scale engine, the world's most powerful AI computer. It gives us cluster scale performance to solve the hardest deep learning problems of today on a single chip. And it's not just the concept. The CS1 system with the wafer scale engine is up and running real customer workloads at scale today. Thank you very much.